Hello, and welcome to Eclectic Spacewalk Conversations. I'm your host, Nicholas McKay. Today, we are joined by Celine Haliwa. Celine is a founder and CEO of Loyal, a company working to develop therapies that treat the underlying causes of aging in dogs. Celine has a background in venture capital, neuroscience, and continues to work on aging and longevity drugs. Welcome to Conversations, Celine. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. So first off, uh, Celine, where were you born? Uh, I was born in Austin, Texas. So keeping it weird. <laughs> Absolutely. Love the live music. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. That, I mean, I've been there a couple of times and, and love it, but uh, it seems like there's a lot of people also coming from California to Austin, Texas uh, nowadays. <laughs> yeah. I would never admit you're Californian and change your license plate immediately if you move from California to Texas, because they literally, they hate, like it's a whole thing. Uh, it's a whole thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like a cultural point. Is it, is, do you think that there's more exodus from San Francisco or Los Angeles? Because we've seen an exodus down here for sure. I I don't know. I mean, a lot of my friends have left SF now, but they all went to New York. Oh, it's okay. kind of the cool place to go or LA, actually. Sure, sure. Gotcha. It's mostly like, uh, I think the people who can buy mansions often go to Austin. <laughs> so you can get really big mansions in Austin. Right, right, right. <laughs> I, so I'm originally from Chattanooga, Tennessee. And I was, my buddy was actually, who lives here in Los Angeles. He was looking at houses there and, you know, he saw a house that was a mansion for 600,000 or something in here. It would just, yeah. you can't get that. So, but um, anyway, so we'll, we'll move on. Uh, so let's, let's go back to kind of your cosmopolitan international background. Uh, very interesting that yes. your mom is from Morocco, your dad mm -hmm. is from Germany and you're born in Texas and you've mm -hmm. studied kind of all over the world. So um, tell us a little bit about your academic journey and then maybe let's start off uh, a little bit about like what, what started the curiosity? Was it books, parents, you know, a cool uncle, like what, what happened with the curiosity? Yeah. So I, my parents are uh, what I would call very first generation, um, like don't even have US citizenship, both have really strong accents. I used to have a strong accent, but then it was like Texas in the, the late 90s and they thought I had a speech impediment because uh, I pronounced like the, like the, like Verdi Das in German. Right, right, right. Um, so I unfortunately don't have an accent now unless I'm like feeling really passionate. Um, but no, actually my interest, I've always been a huge animal lover, 15 cats, dogs, we used to rescue wild animals all the time. Um, I trained horses. But I was okay. actually not very, uh, I was like the opposite of kind of like a teal fellow, tiger, teenager, you know, building things in the garage. I was actually a total truant. Uh, I went really only to my art classes. I was in the bottom 10 of the high school. Mm -hmm. uh, I was like actually fundamentally incredibly unmotivated. I missed my math final because I got drunk the night before in like a <laughs> ditch, um, which my math teacher was really unhappy about. Right, right. <laughs> Um, but then, so I, I got into uni for, or UT Austin for art school and I got like a full ride to go do that. But then the summer before I was about to start my undergrad career for reasons that I really don't know why I decided to go do a internship in a neuro-oncology clinic. Um, I think cause I was like very artistically interested in the brain. I thought like brain MRI scans, especially were incredibly gorgeous. I just was curious to see it real. And I uh basically like the long story short is I had a bit of an existential crisis I kind of always thought that doctors are magical that if you like tried and worked hard that you'd be able to you know fix whatever is wrong with somebody um and I just met a number of terminal uh brain cancer patients who would find people like sitting in front of me and just knowing that they were going to die and like there's nothing anybody could do it didn't matter how much money or effort or time or care they were done no matter what they like wanted to do in their life going forward. And it just, just totally freaked me out. Honestly, I was right, just like, right. wow, like how can anybody live with this knowledge? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so I switched from art school to neuroscience, which we were very unhappy about. And I really didn't have any exposure at Silicon Valley, or, like, you know, the kind of career paths that you have here. So I thought I was going to be a doctor. I was a really like, you know, I was a tiger pre-med student for a little bit. Then I thought I was going to be a researcher. Um, I spent my entire four years in the lab. Uh, I started a PhD at Oxford in economics of gene therapy. So basically looking at the economics, expensive preventive medicines and trying to understand how mm. different healthcare systems are able to handle or not handle uh, therapeutics of that, um, of that type. And then basically realized that academia was not really for me for a number of reasons I'm like happy to get into, but kind of came down to like the cultural aspects, honestly, mm -hmm. Oxford's very conservative institution. 
Mm -hmm. um, despite being a fun place to be at. So I dropped out, went to go work with Laura Deming at the Longevity Fund. Um, and I, I didn't really know what venture capital was, but I was attracted to it because it seemed like a diversified theory of impact, right? So if you facilitate 20 companies working on aging, three of them make it, and you know that they help you know 5 million patients, you're some portion of that, right? It was a cool way to be one of the many in terms of your impact on human health. Um, and it, like that being at Laura was Laura for two, about two years. I still work with her today was really when I learned all about like everything, right? Like right, I learned all right. about Silicon Valley and building companies and that, you know, you can do, you, you not do whatever you want in terms of like a biological ethics stance, but in terms of like the rules are not actually, like, many of the rules are not real in terms of like, you have to have like these letters behind your name to do, you know, X, Y, and Z in terms of like mm -hmm. building stuff. And yeah, I haven't gone into more, but basically got the idea for loyal while I was at longevity funds left on Jody Fund, started Loyal and been going on that ever since. Awesome. Well, we'll definitely get into Loyal. I want to get into Longevity Fund, but then yeah. maybe you, you you mentioned a very disparate and very kind of eclectic approach and honestly of, the, of your entire journey. And, and it seems like there's a lot of hardships and a lot of truths and, you know, uh, uh, conf confrontations and stuff. But what did you learn most about yourself in that journey? Because um, it seems mm. like you had to go to Austin, Texas or, you know, and then change things and then do all this other stuff. Like, was it just yeah. progressing, moving forward? Like, what did you learn most about yourself? during that journey I think there's a lot of things I think one I so I went so I my I did my first I grew up in Austin obviously I have you know foreign parents but mm -hmm. really kind of never like it's just like the culture I was always trying to be Texan in many ways right because I felt like culturally very different sure um you know I tried to force myself to like football and things like that which is but huge then, in Texas like huge. it is the king yeah 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 totally. never got into it <laughs> Never enjoyed a tailgate. Never did it. <laughs> so I think like the first big thing I learned was actually, so I spent and spent a year in Sweden and decided on Sweden because it was the most kind of culturally different place I could think of from Texas, socialized healthcare system, super cold, like not materialistic. Right. And I think that helped me see where I thought things were consonants in terms of, uh, or constants in terms mm -hmm. of like just the way people thought about things were actually variables, right? Mm -hmm. um, yep. mm -hmm. And so just seeing variables where once everything was constant was just a huge realization and like many of like the preconceived biases and like uh, actually incorrect frameworks that I had that which applied to me a lot. So that was a really big one. I think one of the big things I learned working with longevity fund um, was the like what depth of understanding actually looked like. Uh, mm -hmm. I uh, had done a lot of learning in terms of getting good grades and studying and like MCAT and stuff like that. But working with Laura and actually having a depth of understanding and a responsibility for the outcome, you need to have that depth to have the outcome, right? Like you can pass the test, but it doesn't mean you can develop a drug mm -hmm. type thing. That was a huge learning and also leaning into uh, my intelligence, which I never did because it also made me uncool at UT Austin to like study on a Friday night, or at least in the circles <laughs> I ran in. Right, um, right. And I think the thing I learned at Oxford was like, uh, how much of hierarchy and structure is like meant for control and how much of it is like fake. And I, I uh, yeah. it's a little bit of a longer and somewhat sad story, but kind of uh, I've written about this before that I had a, a person in power over me at Oxford who was uh, harassed me and was terrible. And it, it was terrible for many reasons, but I think it was actually like very foundational because it just made me realize that this person was just like not better than me like he did it because he was insecure he did it because mm. he was trying to control me uh, and he I was more competent to him than him despite the fact that I was like underneath him in like this artificial ranking of academia uh and it just it just like and I remember I got in trouble for like talking to somebody like two levels above me instead of one level and it was just like all these little things just made me realize um I don't know it's like when you're like immigrant family like you kind of grow up and like you love the rules, like the rules are mm. a path to guaranteed six figure salary and all these things, which when you don't have that, it's like a really big deal. And like realizing how much of that actually, like, it doesn't matter if you want to be a doctor, right? right but it doesn't necessarily right. matter if you want to be like what I'm there's, doing now. There's power dynamics at play. Yeah. There's politics, there's all kind of information streams. Yeah. It's very interesting uh, yeah. that, that you've learned kind of different things at different levels. And obviously uh, I w kind of also want to get into at, at some point, you know, womanhood and, you know, Silicon Valley and, and stuff like that as well. But let's, um let's, I guess, just uh, keep, keep going through like who, who makes or you, you, and what makes you tick. Uh, you said writing to learn things. I liked that on your, on your website. Uh, so I guess talk about what writing does for you 
and I guess we can also start, um, and we'll pick this up at later on in the conversation when we talk about, you know, curative medicine, but I thought that you pinned a, a pretty, you know, amazing kind of, uh, uh, remembrance of your friend, you know, basically yeah. saying uh, about like, as I develop as a scientist and an individual, I hope to use this platform to share my learnings, mistakes and musings on the topics of longevity, biotech and self development. I am definitely naive and certainly over enthusiastic, but that will just make more of an interesting journey and ample content. Well, here we are making ample content. <laughs> yeah. So the beautiful words, but then also like, how, how do you not, you know, not just take theory to action in terms of like helping, you know, maybe uh, further your friend's, you know, message or uh, memory or whatever, but then, you know, how, how do you, how do you use it as like a, a tool to maybe get things going? Maybe that's, you know, your uh, framework or how you start building real things in the real world and maybe you write them in your imagination. So maybe let's, you know, cross that bridge. Yeah. So I got into writing for a couple of reasons. Um, I, well, first and foremost, I'm the most clear thinking when I'm writing uh, mm. by far. I've gotten a lot better about it verbally, but I've always just been better at thinking through, seeing the flaws in my logic, understanding kind of the scope of possibilities and leaning sure. into one. And I also just really enjoy the art of writing. Um, and I'm at least, you know, it's a skill, but it's like some, it's a skill that I've been able to like build over the last few years. Um, and also it's more in general, like trying to communicate science in a way that's accessible to other people. Mm, um, there's huge. definitely blogs on my website that are not great, but like writing them and putting them public and like being okay with them not being perfect has been mm. so foundational to uh, both like learning the explicit thing I was learning, but also more on a more meta point, like finishing things, sending it out there, having confidence in it you know, learning in public, like, I, I don't really, I, I guess I like kind of by some definitions, like build in public or whatever, but I really more yeah. like try to like learn in public. Mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. it's the thing that's more interesting. And, and the other reason I, I find it helpful is um, I find that putting something to word like takes away a lot of emotional attachments. Like I have like my flaws listed on my website. I have my like vanity goals um, and my goals goals. Right. And just something about having it written down really um, I mean, I still obviously have emotion about like things that are the many things that are wrong with me, but it's, it, it, it lowers it a little bit and helps me be more surgical mm. about um, what I'm trying to do, which is really important if you're like in any high growth role, but especially like something like this, like who I need to be changes every six months at this company, every three months at this company. Sure. So it doesn't matter if I'm good at my job now, right? Like I was like a really good, like series C founder. Um, but if I was that person today, I'd be an absolutely terrible leader, right? So uh, that's like, it's, it's the hack I have found for, you know, at least right now, like continuing a high growth rate. Yeah. And not to belabor the two point uh, 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 too much, but then also it sounds like through your journeys and stuff, your writing has probably changed and, and taken on many yeah. different things, like not just for proposals and, and this and, 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 you know, series fundings and stuff like that, but then blog posts, essays, uh, for, all these kind of things. So it, is there, I mean, do you just have to kind of look at the context of what it is in the medium and just do that? Cause I, I mean, it just seems like writing is a big part of this kind of like tech journey nowadays like it's it's kind of you can't take writing out fr from this whether it be writing on the uh online or something like that you have to get yeah. your message out yeah i mean so i think my writing has evolved as i've had more interesting things to say so okay. in the beginning i really Naturally. just wrote yeah i really <laughs> just wrote about like my motivations obviously but then also i did a lot of like dissections of science as like a way to like learn like there's one about like peptide drugs actually because i was looking at a peptide drug company it was laura um, yeah, yeah. and now it's more like meta on terms of like the company or growth or, you know, building, uh, fundraising, things like mm -hmm. that, because like, mm -hmm. that's what I have to share. And I'm sure it'll become like more uh, philosophical and more meta maybe, um, as I kind of go forward. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think like the mistake a lot of people make is they think like they look at the established writers, like PG yeah, didn't write PG essays when he was mid twenties. Right. <laughs> Um, but it's like building and I, I, who knows if I'll ever like have something that's like as well, like respected as that, but it's building the habit and like the competency now. So that like, as you have the insight earned over decades, you're able to communicate them in a well, that, a way that helps other people. And nobody's really done that super well for bios, a couple people like Lifeside VC and whatnot, but generally speaking, there's not a lot of good accessible 
bio writing. That's great. Well, uh, hopefully we can share some of, some of this stuff as yeah. well in the show notes. Um, so let's let's uh, keep in with kind of your your journey. Uh, you mentioned Laura Deming uh, and, and basically your your work at the Longevity Fund. You were her chief of staff. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and then also I saw at Loyal, you're you know basically looking for a chief of staff. So let's let's just talk about kind of that role of like learning on the fly, like you said, learning in public, and then now you're basically having to look for it again. Um, and then we'll get into kind of neuroscience, nano uh, yeah. biology, technology, but just talk about kind of your, your learning on the job. And then all of a sudden now you're having to institute it yourself. And then it's like, well, I, I know what I did, but at the same time, uh, there's other people that come in, you have to work with people. So just talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So I think, you know, me and Laura's working in a relationship was actually pretty terrible for a while. And I think the big switch that happened is when I stopped caring what she thought, I started caring about the outcome that we were both going for and became almost a foil um because we we had like very have very like complementary skill sets right like she's very uh she's better at science than i am she's very intellectual she's very uh you know dives deep into like certain like competencies uh versus like i mean i'm those things too but i'm much more stronger like people and organization mm. and momentum mm. and like operational execution and like the doing the thing a lot um and so really kind of when stuff started going really well is when I was just like, here, here are your category weaknesses. I'm just gonna like poke you on them until like that's not a weakness for the organization, which was the goal, right? right, um, right, right. Because your, your, your weaknesses just like uh, radiate across the company. I mean, my weaknesses radiate across Loyal now. Um, so I think really a good chief of staff is that. They're just like a, a foil to you. That's, I, I like that. I like that because they're, you're, your your first person, you know, in battle, but at the same time, uh, they also have to kind of like massage you <laughs> a little bit as a leader. Um, so yeah. let's, let's, uh, talk a, a little bit more about your experience. Uh, I'm going to say this and what, you, what the research you did, uh, for, for the people at home, but, um, the development of a novel fluorescent silver nano cluster based oh, neuronal geez. tracer. So <laughs> I don't know what any of that means. Uh, but at the same time, you kind of, uh, worked on some of these therapeutics. And then maybe let's just start off by talking about neuroscience and nanobiotechnology as a discipline as you know, in, in general. Yeah. So for context, I have not thought about this in probably at least five years. So if there's any Fantastic. experts, you know, they're probably <laughs> going to be horrified. Sorry. I only think about aging now, but I, th I think the thing that's like the important takeaway. So one thing I did really well in undergrad, um, I really annoyed UT Austin when I did this is I basically figured out a hack to uh, get almost all of my course credit from being in the lab. Uh, they were like mm. creating a new department. They like messed up the coding. So I was able to register for like the limited lab courses in like multiple departments at once that I didn't register that they shouldn't like for their equivalent. Amazing. <laughs> um, Amazing. And they, they got really bad at me. Uh, so sorry, UT. Yeah. But uh, what that meant is that I worked, uh, most people only ever worked in my lab. I worked in two. I worked in a nanotech lab. Um, that was basically the idea of like this like small nanomaterials that are like structured right. in certain ways. And then I also worked in a neuropharmacology lab um, and I spent more time in this one, which was the idea of um, making, basically understanding the we have a reward pathways in our brain. Um, addiction is obviously involved in that. And we were trying to understand what are the plasticity changes? What are the changes in expression of proteins and uh, intracellular protein levels and behaviors around um, alcohol addiction? It was a mouse mm. model of alcohol addiction. Wow. Um, so I used to like get up every I'd, like party until 3 a.m. and then get up at 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. and go and, like take care of the mice. I like to look things back to that. I'm like, I just lit, I, you know, I got up at 7 30 today and it was terrible. Terrible. Yeah. Uh, what a trooper back in the days when we we're young and spry. Yeah. Oh, like, oh my God. Yeah. It's I, so bad. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like I think the interesting thing there is like I was, I'm never was like the greatest laboratory scientist, right? Mm. I never will be. Um, I've not touched my pattern in a long time. But what was interesting is I was <laughs> the only one at the intersection. Right. right. So I was the right. only one who was working on nanotech stuff and then also working on neuropharmacology work. Um, so basically what happened was we, so this, you know, trigger warning, I'm going to talk about like mice being sacked for scientific research. Mm -hmm. uh, what we would do is we'd induce these mice to develop alcohol addiction or alcohol dependency um, in these operant chambers. Uh, then we would uh, euthanize them. And it is like a way in which you can 
uh, get the fresh brain and like do actually patch clamp readings. So like the activity readings on like very specific neurons oh, wow. in okay. the brain to try to understand like differential activity in terms of like action potential. So like basically like the shooting of a neuron to, of one signal to another neuron mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. how that change. Okay. Um, but one of the issues is like you need to label, it's just a mass, right? You can't like see neurons really. And you need to know which one is like the specific subtype. So you had these like genetically modified mice that had like certain subtypes of neurons colored or not colored Got it. but uh-huh. basically it was just like hard to get like the tracing of these neurons was very very difficult um and like the traces we used weren't that great and they weren't that selective and they didn't have like the fluorescence and so they would like bleach out the minute you went under the microscope so then if you didn't patch clamp immediately like good luck you'd never find it and that mouse that took like god knows how many weeks to like, get conditioned is now like a lost cause wow wow okay so a lot so, of complexity to just get to one yeah. one reading okay exactly yeah. um so for the lab I was working on, um, the other one, I was like nanotech, but I just started doing my own thing. And I like learned and read about these like fluorescent tracers that were basically just like DNA strands. And you would like actually tune the DNA, the, the fluorescence wavelength by um, wow. the sequence of the oligonucleotide. So just like a short DNA strand. Um, and then it was Very like cool. with silver and something about the interaction of things, it's silver and guanine, I think it is, uh, would basically cause like fluorescent uh, phenotype. And so the idea, it's like non-toxic, right? It's like DNA and silver. Idea is like, could you turn this into a fluorescent uh, neuronal tracer for cheap that could be used in these like mice studies? Uh, wow. These other contexts we were doing surgeries where like injecting things into the brain. Um, and like, it like kind of works, you know, like it, 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 there was no like company to be built or anything. But what was like really valuable was because it was like the zero to one of mm, thinking sure. through a problem, understanding a thing, connecting the dots, you know, got like a thousand dollar grant from the university to work on it, which is like any Stanford kid is probably just like, wow, like I get that. So like <laughs> proof of concept. Cool, right. Yeah. 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 Um, but it meant a lot to me. Right. Uh, Cause I mean, I got to do this thing that was like totally non like accepted anywhere else. Right. Um, and that's what got me really interested in. I think this is such a stereotypical world word, but like just like building and like ideating and executing on executing on ideated. Right. That, and that whole pathway and that whole like progression is very interesting because it seems like you've started this on, on a couple of journeys, but then now you've, you've done it for a whole company. Now you've like literally just started it. Um, so let's, before we get into loyal specifically, um, let's go just a little farther back. Uh, when you gave in the summer of 2019, a series of lectures for the longevity funds, venture fellows on basically the basics of building one of these biotechnology companies. Yeah. So it's really interesting. I, I looked through some of it. Uh, I'll definitely link it in the show notes, but uh, maybe we can just highlights, you know, first steps, raising money, building in bio, and then regulation and clinical trials. Cause it seems like you obviously have to have a roadmap of somewhere where you're going to go or where you want to go. But then it seems in this kind of area or arena of biotechnology, you are at the frontier, you know, kind of the bleeding edge of science and stuff like that. So maybe regulation, how you tiptoe and, and how you get funding. Uh, so maybe let's just, you know, gloss over what is, you know, biotechnology specifically therapeutics for pathological agents aging and then how you would maybe start and build a biotech company, you know? So basically are you asking for like a primer on the field or? Yeah. Well, yeah, basically a primer on like biotechnology, because like, I, I want to kind of go mm. d- differently of like what neuroscience and nanobiotechnology, because nanobiotechnology to me as a layman just seems like you're going smaller and smaller. And then biotechnology, maybe it means like you're doing larger scale therapeutics or, or something like that. But maybe that, that's just because I'm not a, you know, in, in, in the know. So maybe tell the difference yeah. of that. <laughs> so biotech kind of, uh, well, it depends on the stage, but biotech kind of okay. like the two big things are like biotech and pharma and they encompass the industry. And then there's also basic research or just like kind of research stage work, which can get funneled into biotech, um, okay. but doesn't always get funneled into biotech. So the way to think like a pharma company is basically an established um, freestanding, you know, not, maybe like self-sustaining asterisk mark uh, company. And it's actually like quite rare for like a pharma uh, to like be born because it's very difficult to get to that self-sustaining state. So a lot of pharma companies go and there's like this whole industry of like taking stuff out of academia to go um, or like independent ideas, which is kind of where my ours came from to create these biotech companies that like sometimes become independent companies, but like more often than not become actually a pharma company. Wow. Uh, or become ado- uh, acquired 
uh, by a pharma company as like basically an externalized R and D mechanism, right? Oh, if you I think see, about it, it's like mm-hmm. you know maybe mm-hmm. we had learned like this didn't happen, but let's say like maybe we learned that like a specific protein is always upregulated in these mice that we induce this alcohol dependency in, and then we show in the mice that inhibition of this protein's activity maybe ameliorated the addiction effect, right? Wow. Um, okay. If we like, if that discovery had been made, like that would be great in academia. Then usually, what would happen is like the core IP about that would be out licensed to a biotech company, which would then go and develop a drug product. It would like file the regulatory filings, like maybe start a clinical study, show some proof of concept, some initial efficacy, and then usually around like the middle stage of clinical studies, so like phase two, which is basically uh, like confirmatory safety and preliminary efficacy. You know, once wow. they've shown that in people then that would probably get acquired if it seemed promising by a pharma company to be translated into a product or more likely fail or be killed for whatever reason. Yeah. So the pipeline, man, that's so interesting because I, I, I'm not obviously not versed in it, but that seems like the, the, the drug um, manufacturing and pipeline is, is something that is not for the faint of heart. You know? no. <laughs> like, oh my God, no. Yeah. The bio is like part of it. But honestly, like CMC chemistry manufacturing and controls, like the making a drug product, like if you sure. take aspirin, it's like you have the active pharmaceutical ingredient and then you have a ton of other stuff, right? And you have oh, like sure. the sugary coating and you have to make it in a standardized, reputable way and you have to like package it correctly and the thing has to say the correct stuff and um, to monitor it. And it's like there's all these things like clinical studies. The like clinical studies are damn hard to run. Like we just finished our first like non drug study and that was damn hard. Right. Uh, well, maybe let's, let's go like right into good. that. Cause that was, that was going to be, let, let's talk, the oil was going to be my next thing. So let, let's talk about that. Like what exactly was this new novel kind of things that you guys, and you guys uh, did a um, 500 participants. I think I saw all the pictures of all of them. So, They're so uh, cute, aren't they? <laughs> right, right. So uh, before we talk about like, uh, or maybe before we talk about that, what let's just, take it up to what is loyal? Like, what is the company that you, you founded? Yeah. Uh, why? And then, yeah, let's get in right into, you know, the, the first study that you, that you guys did. Yeah. So I guess to give context, um, I was uh, working at Longevity Fund. I had zero intention to leave. Um, I was very okay with like my role being supporting Laura to, mm-hmm. you know, have her impact on the world and kind of being her foils. So she would be more effective. Uh, However, and, and I never again like grew up with any of this like founder like mm, stuff, um, I which I think is actually really helpful because I think starting like a lot of people, I think you no, know, it's it's very difficult to not get seduced by the idea of starting a company, sure. uh, and like seduced by like how sexy it is or whatever to be on podcasts like this and whatnot. <laughs> uh, but I thankfully didn't have any. Of that. I didn't get like convinced to start the company, um, yeah. but I had the initial idea because I got really frustrated with the companies that were pitching us at loyal uh, at longevity fund. It was basically like all the exact same narrative. Like, oh, we've, we found this drug or this mechanism extends lifespan by 20, 30, 40% in mice. Like, this is amazing. You know, slide five, FDA is evil. Aging isn't a disease. It's like this like canonical thing that like people who don't understand aging always tweet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry for the live subtweet. No, um, no, no. This is going to be great. <laughs> and, you know, it, it's not a disease. So, you know, we're going to go and develop the drug instead for a specific indication, right? We're going to develop it for right. osteoarthritis or just like random orphan pediatric disorder that has nothing to do with aging, but like happens to hit the same mechanism of action. But don't worry, like there's some like extrapolated path to how we get to people. But then, you know, when you get to uh, the slide 20, it's like the exit return slide. And it's just like, oh, we're going to have to get acquired by Pfizer by phase three, right? <sighs> Um, and Pfizer's never going to develop it for aging. So it just like seems stupid to me that like all these shots and goal. And then the other thing is like aging is a specific mechanism, right? So like expecting an aging drug that like actually holistically targets aging, it does not, uh, uh, I would, it, it, it might, but it should not like necessarily naturally or inherently also be efficacious for a very specific disease. Mm, um, okay. And so then you're leading yourself up to false fails. Like I think if the aging field dies, it's going to die um, within false fails. It, it's and we've already seen like companies that have been struggling with that um and that's like my worst fear for loyal is false fails like i'm probably over fundraised because i'm just like it want insurance from that because the thesis is correct it's just, uh, the execution and the brand biological randomness is kind of where you get get got um but anyhow so that was the context i got frustrated by this i was like how the hell can i develop a drug explicitly for you know aging and lifespan extension and nothing else i want to do any of this like stupid like bs and came to conclusion, can't do it in humans unless I have a billion dollars. I don't have a billion dollars. Um, if you have a billion dollars, like let me know. 
Um, but I realized you could do it in dogs uh, and you could do it in dogs um, actually relatively quickly, uh, relatively like easily. It's really hard, but like, sure, sure. from a relative standpoint, easier. Um, and it wouldn't cost, like it didn't, doesn't cost that much money to develop a drug for uh, market approval in dogs. So for contacts, it's often, uh, the quoted number is 2 billion. Um, that like includes fails. So maybe like the actual number is somewhere between like 500 million, to 800 million to get a drug to like market approval, depending on the indication and whatnot. For dogs, it's like less than 20. Um, wow. And it can be even cheaper uh, too, if you're just like efficient, basically. Damn. Um, so yeah, I had the idea, was not convinced about it. Uh, long story short, a VC named Greg Rosen like heard that I'd been like joking about this idea actually. Uh, and kind of over the period of a few months, him and Laura convinced me that I should really go and do this. Um, and the story that I'll tell now, uh, that I didn't tell in the beginning, is I wasn't actually convinced and I didn't actually commit until I got the term sheet and signed it. Like, oh, I got the term okay. sheet and I probably like scared Greg because I like didn't like reply for a few days. And then I was like, fine. And then I signed it and I did. And I've never, you know, never regretted it. But sure. But you <laughs> needed the time to take it out. Yeah. Really take it and, and think about it. It's like having a baby. Yeah. <laughs> Well, because I mean, but that's nine months to accept that, right? I had like three days. Right. But it, it must seem cool to even, uh, or a, I don't know what you would call it, maybe a pat on the shoulder or uh, a thing that just makes you proud because I'm assuming that some of that imposter syndrome was coming in of like, can I be a founder doing all this other stuff? But then having someone like Laura, you know, who you worked under, but then also is a big in the field to then push you, like how how much was that part of that decision and, and, and moving forward and not just like yeah. waiting, but then signing eventually, you know? I mean, I remember something that uh, both Greg and Laura like had, you know, things that they said to me um, that were very encouraging, but it was like largely they thought that I could be a like predominant founder one day. And I never saw myself that way. I still don't like really see myself that way. Uh, but it's actually one of the reasons why female mentors are so important because, mm. you know, I reached out to Laura because she was the only woman basically in aging doing something independently. I mean, sure. I'm, uh, there, there's like Chris and Fortney and BioAge and whatnot. So like there, there are other ones, but like at the time it was like the only one I was aware of and there are not that many. Right. Uh, and I really just didn't, I, I think that that subconscious facilitatory aspect was really, really um, helpful, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I, it's interesting because it's like a very different pattern. I think like you often pattern to founders who like really are like, you know, I'm going to like, take over the world and be president one day and like I'm now kind of that way right but I, I think honestly a lot of women are like more humble a lot in the beginning or like self-conscious or insecure or, you know whatever word you want to use mm -hmm. um and I'm like definitely like a good founder it just like took me some time to get there and, and then let's, I, I guess, just keep going with, I, I loved a blog post of one of your writings, uh, how I raised an $11 million seed at the first time female solo founder for a biotech moonshot. So I, I really like loved the honesty and vulnerability, but then also like yeah. kind of the um, more so kind of call to action. You know what I mean? Like, hey, like if, if I'm doing this, like y'all can to be too, you know what I mean? I know that you have specific, you know, kind of things in, in yourself. And the reason why you got this, you said your advantages were fundraising, you had a neuroscience background and stuff, but like, how does womanhood gender play a role in kind of these founding? Because I, you are the first, but then I'm assuming, uh, and then through your writing, you've said you want to kind of open this up to, to more and more people. So how does womanhood, you know, gender play a role, especially in circles like Silicon Valley and startups, uh, and, and then moving forward, but then also how, how do you, you know, democratize and make it more egalitarian? So not just women, but then also maybe lower class, uh, lower income, you know, all those other kind of things that, that people are pushing for. Yeah. So it's interesting. Austin Allred actually wrote a really good post on this, which um, I, I'll have to find it for you, where he basically talked about all the things that you don't learn when you grow up with parents who don't work in like professional, mm -hmm. my dad's a carpenter, my mom's a teacher, like who don't work in like these kinds of industries. Sure. that are like little secrets that uh <laughs> yes, like are yes. tells if you're like in the know or not right so my, my speech like i changed my, my speech pattern is like kind of how i talk but it's also like patterned a bit on uh yeah. when i first moved here i listened to literally every single y combinator podcast uh because i wanted to learn the um the like what intelligence co and competency sounded like and also i was like learning all the background of um of um like silicon valley and the lore and the people and like who's important and not important in the valley oh, like sure. lots of quotation marks around that phrase but 
Um, and there's just like so many little things like that. Um, so that was like one that like, that was honestly what caused me the most pain <laughs> over the last like two years. And it's still causing me pain. Like the problem is now, I was just talking to somebody about this actually. Like one of my things I'm most nervous about this next stage of the company is that I have to go and raise money from like a different, I now understand like the seed series A, like Silicon Valley thing. I know what they look for. I don't like what they look for always, but I can, you know, if I can suck it up a little bit, right. I can do that thing. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, the later stage capital is a totally different ball game all over again, right? And it's a lot sure. of it's like not insider in terms of like the fraudulent sense, but insider in terms of like you get drinks with the person and they whisper about doing a deal and like this and this person are friends and you know, you go get beers with them as a founder. And like, you often don't yeah. get opportunities to do it as a woman because they're always like nervous about like cross signals and things like that. Um, mm-hmm. Like, and also uh, it, it's just like, it's hard to be in that scenario without it bleeding, especially when you're like a mid twenties woman, right? Sure, um, I can imagine, yeah. And so then you like miss these, uh, miss these opportunities. Um, actually, like I, I mean, this is a little bit of a side, I came forward about like uh, prominent aging guy Aubrey de Grey who's yep. uh you know definitely not a great person um and a lot of women have like dealt with this in the aging field and unfortunately haven't spoken up before me and Laura did or haven't had like the the ability to speak up before Laura and I did um uh, but like that was like a very calculated thing it's like I did it because it was right because I knew I'd hate myself forever if I found out that, like it happened again or it we, we thought it uh there was like some reason to believe it like it was mm-hmm. um but it's also like now I have a little bit of a warning sign above my head like you know, is Celine going to accuse me of a harassment if I like go and hang out? And like, of course I won't, right? Like, sure, but the thing is like, sure. people don't understand. Um, there's not like a, it's just like an awkwardness about all these conversations. Like hitting on somebody isn't harassment necessarily, right? It's like a series of like variables that like come in together that like lead to that. Absolutely. Um, but they don't even want to risk it, right? Because like their career is more important. Like it's just like, it's, it's difficult to think about. So then you just get kind of like, you know, blocked off. Right. Um, and we're still in the transitionary period between that old, old kind of paradigm yeah. and then a new paradigm, which seems like it at least is more respectful, more out in front, more honest, and, and, and is at least going against some of those tendencies of the past. A hundred percent. And I think a big thing, it's, it's, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. Because I think you mm. need, it will only ever fundamentally change when you have a number of female founders who go and build billion dollar companies that become the pattern that people match on for the next things and who also become the funders for the next mm. gen, right? Right. But right, the difficulty right. is like, like I, I got in the case of this like, you know, large fund a few months ago because they only had one female partner. Uh, mm. She was the m- most recent addition to the partnership and she focused a lot on FemTech. And I was like, what, what the hell guys? Like, what, what are you doing? Like be better, right? Right, right, right. Um, And like, of course they're making a difference. Like the transition period's never gonna be great. Like I appreciate they're like trying, right? But it was just like, um, it does make it difficult because also when like the women aren't at the top, like the, the, the ones that the lead of the fund are the ones that you do like the beer drinks deals with. And it's just like more difficult to hit that if you're a female founder. Sure. Um, so I, sorry, I don't remember how I got onto this, but like no, no, no. category <laughs> is an interesting challenge of yeah. that. And then there's like the obvious stuff. Like I, I get compared to Elizabeth Holmes all the time. Like I'm, I'm not Elizabeth Holmes, right? <laughs> but I get compared to it all the time. It like kind of sucks. Um, and it's just like, you know, I mean, it's, um, like, I think the, like the, the succinct, like TLDR I would give, like, I don't, people don't like walk into a room. Like, I don't walk into a room and people assume I'm competent. I have to like really be on point to like show that I'm competent. Totally. Um, and it's just hard to do that on top of, you know, everything else. Right. And, and that, and that's, uh, that's a unfortunate, you know, thing to bear at at this point, but we're glad that, you know, you're at least (laughs) trailblazing in in some ways. Um, so let's just talk about, let, let's talk about loyal, you know, so like what, obviously the process of, of getting it up, getting it running, what is the, the bigger points? Like, what are you, not just for the dogs, the owners, like for general society. So let's just kind of do this kind of holistic kind of thing of what loyal is. And then maybe you can go into specific things about the, uh, um, the studies and the science and stuff, but then maybe even just kind of touch on the communication, because this is an interesting you know, kind of thing that I, I, I came through this just from the normal uh, aging longevity, Lord Dimming. I actually, Aubrey de Grey was the, the, the first kind of way I, I even knew about the field at all. And then now it's a completely different thing that now we're talking about uh, dogs, you know, and animals. Yeah. And then that's like, okay, I'm, I'm in, but like, how do, how do we get here? You know? <laughs> 
Yeah, so I, the thesis of Loyal, uh, the goal of Loyal is to get the first ever drug proof for lifespan extension and health span extension. So number of years lived, quality of years lived yep. um, for dogs, but also just in general, <laughs> do it yes. and then use that momentum uh the like insane amounts of like biological insight uh the competency of a translational team uh to go and build the first ever human aging drugs too uh, okay. and really like my goal in life is to build uh what i tend to describe as like the spacex and moderna of aging um so basically the idea of like the company that um when people think about aging they think about loyal like they think about mm. um us as like the predominant brand, you know, people will cite hopefully one day like loyal as exposing them to the field of aging or the reason why they're excited. If you work in aging, like, you know, it's a, the totally. highest stamp is to have like, you know, worked with loyal before you go and start your own aging company. And like all the like other people who then go start, like there's really a whole industry. Like I think aging will be bigger than oncology one day. Uh, it should because it encompasses many forms of oncology in addition to completely unrelated mechanisms, also unrelated diseases also. Yeah. Um, but I think you just need a big catalyst, like how and Moderna has really catalyzed the mRNA field and SpaceX is really catalyzing, catalyzed, you know, space race, modern sure. day space race. Um, yeah, and so we are kind of currently focusing on uh, two specific things. So one is a drug for uh, large dogs. So large dogs have this like very weird, like size lifespan dimorphism, dimorphism. So the larger a dog is, the shorter its lifespan is. Um, and it goes to a 2x differential. So a Chihuahua mm -hmm. will live approximately like 16 to 18 years on average, while a Great Dane might live like seven to nine, uh, yep. which is Got weird. It. Like you don't see that 2x differential in any other species. And it's very strong, like, like 0.7 R squared or something like that, strongly correlated with body weight. And, and, not to, and, and just to, and for any animals, like you said, like the bigger you are, the, like the bigger heart you have to have and stuff like that. That's you're, you're saying the two X is, is what's interesting on both sides, like within uh, the species, within yeah. the species. Yes. Yeah. That's a huge uh, space. <laughs> yeah. You don't see that in humans, right? <laughs> right. No, no, yeah, definitely not in humans. Yeah. Yeah. And so basically like, the hypothesis is that dogs actually have a monogenic and induced monogenic disorder for aging because we selectively bred dogs and we basically created all these founder effects, bottleneck effects when we were trying to create these phenotypes. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like the phenotype tied to growing fast um, was also uh, uh, incidentally, unintentionally also seems to drive a faster aging rate and therefore a quicker death. So that's our first drug is the idea to like ameliorate that. Mm -hmm. The second drug is for dogs of any size of any breed. It's a bit more of a treatment mechanism, which I think will just be important from a, you know, treatment. It's just like always an easier thing uh, to sell and for people to use pharmaceutically. And it's basically the idea is like caloric restriction is the most well-validated um, longevity intervention. It um, has been shown to extend lifespan in Labrador retrievers. So Labrador retrievers calorically restricted 25% live approximately two years longer, have delayed incidence of cancer, delayed incidence of osteoarthritis. I just actually have a, I don't know if I can raise my <laughs> jacket up, but I actually have a tattoo. Show those my guns. Arm. Yeah, ticket Hell to the yeah. gun. Oh, the okay. The elegant, the black six mouth, and in the black labs from that it's okay. a Purina study. <laughs> Nice, nice. So if anybody says I'm not dedicated, you know. Oh, I'm, no, you have it on tattooed. your body. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's okay. It's hidden in the back. So if loyal fails, you know, I won't be like triggered for the rest of my life. <laughs> triggered. That's um, hilarious. But yeah, so the drug is basically like, uh, instead of, you know, caloric restriction is an extrinsic way to induce, uh, improve metabolic resiliency, metabolic fitness, drugs in an intrinsic way. So it's basically targeting the downstream mechanisms. We hypothesize like primary drivers of this lifespan extension from caloric restriction phenotype. Um, and then we're also working on endpoints. So kind of, you know, we're able to potentially, you know, follow dogs and see lifespan extension that will never work for people. Like it's just mm, not going to happen. Right. So right, you right. really need a circuit endpoint. Um, so something that like cholesterol to statins, right? Like what is the thing that you give a, pharmace a new pharmaceutical and it moves, you know, X, Y, and Z thing that we know um, that it can be extended for lifespan extension because it will extend lifespan. Um, even though we haven't seen that lifespan phenotype yet. Um, so that's another big area of work. Um, and I'm trying to think what else, and a lot of just like basic science research, like understanding novel targets. Uh, we have a partnership with something called the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study, which is like this longitudinal data set uh, given approximately every six months to golden of like uh, blood, uh, saliva, things like that. And it's interesting because golden's A, longitudinal data sets are kind of the holy grail 
but B, goldens uh, develop above average amounts of various forms of age-related cancers. So you want to see if there's genetic or epigenetic uh, dispositions oh, no. in the goldens that do or don't develop the cancer, which um, could be relevant for the human forms of these cancer too. Very cool. Very cool. And, and that, that, man, I, I just keep, I was thinking about dogs and stuff, but then now you bring it back to humans because <laughs> like, yeah. uh, okay. So then bringing it back to the, the loyal and, and, and I, I j- will briefly kind of move on from this, but your meta goals and building lawyer loyal. I, I thought it was very interesting that first and foremost, you know, it was help build a pattern of female led deep tech companies. So we touched on a little bit yeah. of that, but then almost it's like, you want to not exactly become an incubator. I don't want to say that, but then also this is like, you, you want to position yourself as, as a place, like you said, a leader, uh, he, figurehead, uh, or, or a, a um, place where people can go and then go do their own stuff. But then let's keep going down into the thing of socialize the aging thesis to the broader public, which is very cool. Make biotech sex again. But then here's what I, I really was interested in. Number five was help build a playbook for scientists becoming operators, startup founders, and become a 99th percentile operator myself. So very interesting that like you're self-aware enough to maybe put yourself in that kind of 1% because you're a startup founder, but then also to kind of hone in and key in on not just female-led deep tech companies, but then at the end of the day, you know, who are we here for? You know, it's mostly the, the 99th percentile uh, and operating for that. So maybe let's, let's segue into humans a, 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 or like yeah. talk about the, the, the meta goals of loyal and then what you're trying to do more in the future. Uh, and then how we can kind of do that with humans. Cause I think that that through line, it's very interesting that this is like through dogs, like man's best friend, obviously loyal, it, it works, all these things, but then as well, the, the opportunity and potential, it, it seems like they're, they're just just you're your first to post, I guess. I don't, I don't know, like for first to market. Yeah. 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 So sorry. Uh, what, what would you like me to dive into? Let's let's dive into like you basically being a startup founder and then also like keeping it to like thinking of like humans in general in the, in the future, like the 99th percentile and building a playbook for scientists oh, become, yeah. to do them to do it themselves, to become operators and startup founders themselves. Because then that's almost like, I just see like an infinity, you know, a decision trees yeah. of going. And that's kind of what I was trying to get into is like an incubator or something is that mm-hmm. you're just starting it. And then it's like, well, then that person could go down and down and down. And you have all these companies that are eventually uh, moving the, moving the needle. Yeah, so I think maybe it would be helpful to give some context on how most biotech companies are started right now. Um, it's very, it's kind of like a tech before, um, not an expert in tech history, but from what I understand, like before Zuck and these kind of other companies came out insofar that um, there's not a cult of like the young founder or the founder in general in biotech. It's actually often these companies are incubated by VC funds that are basically like, like McKinsey-esque structurally sure. so they have like all these grad students and postdocs that they pay to, like ideate ideas and like the ideas are, like moved up and up across like partners of different levels and then like some of the partners go and like start the company and they hire in a ceo and then they all are like friends with the pharma companies right so then they go and like sell it to their pharma friend if like it works or they don't if it doesn't um and it's, it, to be clear like they're really good at what they do they've built a number right. of amazing companies this way um but there isn't really a like pattern or a uh, playbook, or even honestly, like there's a lot of people who are like trying to become this. I don't think anybody's like the de facto winner yet. Like um, a fund or like thesis of the idea of founder-led biotech. Mm. And the reason why that's so important, um, and to be clear, they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, the reason okay. why it's so important is because it's rate limiting. If you can only have a certain like very small section of the population be qualified, to go and build biotech companies and go and build new drugs, then you're just not going to have that many drugs, right? right? And this is like every drug that is like you used, like almost certainly has come either like internally at a pharma um, or like via like acquisition from a biotech, right? Right. Um, so like one company like getting founded or not founded or failing when it shouldn't have failed or not getting funded because they couldn't raise money because the CEO was like 25 or whatever. Like you have potentially lost a drug and therefore like damned a certain portion of people to a worse life. Um, so this is like the one frustration that I really, really have with the traditional bio and pharma industry is they're so closed off and they're so hierarchical and they're so, uh, I think it's a, the narrative internally is like, well, this is really difficult. This is very serious business, like regulatory, right? This is patients' lives. But I think in like this desire to be closed off and be bearish and cold and exclusive, we've actually limited the number of people and a number of like companies and a number of like, you know, shots on goal that we have. 
Um, and to be amazing. clear, like you need to have the expertise in house, like the people who lead the various aspects of loyal are uh, much more experienced than I am. I don't lead the science, but I catalyze it. Uh, and we need more ca uh, catalysis moments in interesting bio areas. So that's why it's important to me because the other aspect of this is that traditional scientific training really is like the opposite mm -hmm. of what you need to be trained and how you need to think if you want to build a company. Um, unless you basically have gone to like Stanford or Harvard, like they'll give you some like, but even then, like it's uh, really, it's like, it teaches you to like not value time in some ways, like spending seven years on a PhD is something that, like any founder would just go like psycho about, right? You're like optimizing for saving money because you're under, like it's underfunded. You're following the hierarchy. You're buying into the fact that you even need a PhD to do anything. Right, um, right. And of course, like you need to have the competency and the competency, and we have a lot, like many, many PhDs and like, I'm glad we have it. But if you want to be a founder, it often can be co uh, contrary to kind of the antagonistic mindset you need to have to be able to do the thing. Um, right. So I learned it from Laura. Um, but if I hadn't had Laura, I wouldn't have figured any of this out. And so many of them don't. <laughs> and then it's just like pain right. uh, for years. I mean, like often the companies like can't raise money and they just die, even though they're good ideas. Well, so what, one of the things, though, in, in terms of science and then communication of that science, I think that's one of the three ways that has been, I guess, lacking in the last couple of years. There's so much great science, so much great research technology, and then the science communication is maybe lacking in, in some ways. How can we, how are, do, are you kind of going about that problem or a challenge? Yeah. So, I mean, one of my goals in there also is like, make biotech sexy again yeah exactly so my my goal is to eventually like could you have you know updates loyal updates or whatever that are as well attended and as you know aesthetic as sure. like an apple product announcement right no sure. you know it's hard because a lot of it's data a lot of it's caveated you know things like that drugs are not pretty you know they're not as cool as rockets going up and like exploding <laughs> or not exploding you really don't want the explosion yeah. Uh, ever because that's usually has like will have impacted a living creature if it did um so it's a little bit different but um i think that's one aspect of science communication so it's like getting people excited about the idea totally. um i think it's also writing about it so i try to be like verbal about the fact that i'm building an agent and it, it, it's if you really have to be careful right because one thing we're working on is like really finding the balance like how are you consumery but also accessible yep. but also scientifically legit and communicate that you're legit but also don't violate confidentiality and I mean, we haven't found the right balance yet um but i think i think a lot of it is it's not about necessarily teaching people something although that's helpful too i think it's more about catalyzing the interest um mm. and then the last thing i'll say on this is i think the aging field has had like explicitly bad narratives like hilariously bad narratives that have been um, driven by like charlatans in the field sure. because it, it's almost like religious in many ways right like people are so terrified of death that they just look for somebody and like there's always these people who come up and like say these like generalist things that are completely untrue. like what if what would you do if you like continue to live another 20 years and like you know what if you do if you live a thousand and it, it, it's honestly I think unethical like a lot of the narratives that are peddled in aging sure. right now but it also scares competent people away from the field because you look at it and you're like well like if you know anything you can tell this person's an idiot because i think they're tweeting or whatever is like clearly not factual um and then you assume the rest of the field is this way because the person's like a leader in the field um the and expert. like i had this yep. yeah. yeah yeah right like i was skeptical in the field for years like i was interested in the thesis but i was not interested at all in getting involved in the aging and longevity field because i thought it was a bunch of psychos yelling about thousand year lifespans um but it's not actually what it is and hoarding all. wealth like, and blood yeah, all this other yeah. stuff yeah that comes with it yeah yeah yeah. And, and so you really like i think you know dogs are great because it's not controversial like our drugs aren't going to be insanely expensive right it's all cash pay nobody like nobody thinks society is going to fall apart because our dogs are living longer healthier lives and it'll just a, a net positive it. net positive for everyone net around yeah. <laughs> all the way <laughs> yeah. so then let's let's kind of transition into i mean obviously you you're, you're doing this for the dogs at first you're we're, we're loving for the our, our fellow 
creatures uh, and everything. But then let's maybe stick to, uh, you, you talked a little bit about your writing specifically about just being getting out ideas, but then maybe some meta ones. And I'm just, uh, I'm going to put you on the spot, but this is a playful spot. What are your kind of yeah, thoughts yeah. philosophically about just animals or, you know, pets in general, you know, I mean, and just like oh, philosophically, yeah. like, uh, are you, because uh, I mean, obviously our, our food systems and then eco ec ecology degradation and climate change, like, obviously animals are, are going to be a part of our future. So like, I don't know if you have any waxing things to go on poetically about animals and pets and things like that, but this would be the time to, to talk about it. <laughs> I actually have quite a bit. Um, I don't talk about it that much because I don't want to seem like preachy. Okay. But no, i am um, been vegetarian my entire life. I eat like fish every so often because I moved to Sweden and you know, there was a lot of fish there, but like, don't eat meat. Um, don't eat it explicitly for ethical reasons. Um, I think it's like insanely unethical, the like slaughterhouse industry. I think it's sure. ethical that we think it's okay to like kill a living creature and like subject a living creature to terror uh, for its entirety of life. I think animals are intelligent. I think in some ways they're more intelligent than us in ways that we just can't understand, just like how we can't see like UV. Like sure. we probably can't understand their perspective on a lot of things. Um, and I think that like all life like deserves like I will not kill a bug like I, I think like all life deserves to be respected um, right, right just and, are you more of a dealing yeah. with it and then have it how you deal with it rather than like a a big uh or a big chasm between humans and then everything else you know yeah I mean I think it's just like we're all part of an ecosystem and like even if you do like they are like less you know, mentally involved in some ways I guess you could say but like so are kids <laughs> like, yeah, it's totally, totally. you know they're just per my kids like my dog arguably like some adults celine arguably I, yeah. <laughs> a lot of adults um so yeah i love animals with all my heart um and i yeah i if i you know maybe one day if i like have a crisis and yeah, i'll go like start a wildlife rescue or something right 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 well that's that that's very interesting i mean I, well i'm interested in seeing some more writing about that in, in the future but I should. I, that's actually a really good idea yeah, i've never written about that have i no um yeah no that's that's great write that down i think that might get me canceled well it won't get me canceled i think it'll get me labeled but it's probably yeah i whatever. think you might you might touch a touch point in the culture war so you might be getting it from both yeah. sides just be just be confident of that <laughs> Um, I guess, uh, then let's, let's kind of bring this home, uh, last couple questions. And then let's just talk about, I guess, just, we talked about longevity we talked about, uh, dogs, we talked about neuroscience and all this stuff, but then generally all this is underneath the, the, uh, uh, the umbrella of healthcare, you know, all of this is kind of under health yeah. and what, whatever that means, you know? And so like you, you've had, uh, kind of dealings with, uh, socialized healthcare and other places, but then also you in the United States here with our healthcare system. And I don't know if you've seen that famous graph, but it's from the seventies of like the amount of, uh, administrators versus physicians, you know, the uptick. Yeah. And so it's just like that. I, I don't know if that plays into with, with some of these things, but then, or economic and in, in, incentivization. So let's just kind of talk about the healthcare industry in general like good, bad, sad, and then also in specifically into preventative and curative medicine, because one of the flashpoints of you starting all of this is how your friend, good friend, John uh, passed away. And then, you know, you, you wrote about that. And so let's just talk about, you know, preventative and curative medicine, and then how that might not be available really here in the United States and then other places that might be available and then the healthcare in general. Yeah. Um, so I guess like for context, I uh, like, they didn't grow up with a lot of money. Uh, my mom didn't have health insurance for a really long time. And I had some health issues that caused me to have insanely large medical bills that uh, honestly, my credit score like is still hampered by them today. Um, pump it up, pump it up, Celine. <laughs> <laughs> renting in SF like a little bit difficult sometimes. I mean, thankfully I've like been you know financially fortunate now I've able to pay it all off. Um, but it was really like, scarring. Like I remember as a kid, um, being sick and then telling my dad not to bring me to the ER um, mm. because I knew it was going to cost him thousands of dollars, despite the fact we had health insurance. Sure. Um, and so I think that's like one, one reason I've always been very interested in healthcare. Uh, and then the, the other reason, and the thing I was like studying at my PhD is, I mean, in my view, aging drugs are the ultimate just preventive medicine. Honestly, I don't think it's actually that sexy at all. We're kind of just like a vaccine of a different modality in some ways. Right. Um, but it's actually difficult because like, uh, and this is a gross simplification, but in general, like preventive medicine isn't actually like, super economically incentivized in our current structure. 
um, in terms of like the multi-payer uh, system we have in the US, right? Because uh, the catch-all is like the US government in terms of like when you're 65 and up. Uh, and then before mm -hmm. that you're on private and on average people switch private insurance approximately every two years. So if you think about it, like if you're yeah. taking a preventative medicine that like won't have an impact for you know a couple decades, you're just saving the government money or saving your competitor money. You're not saving yourself money. You're having to pay for it. Wow. Um, and also, I think just like culturally, you know, react like people have a high willingness. That, like you'll pay a hundred half a million dollars for a cancer drug that gives another two months, but you won't pay like much of anything for a preventative thing. And like vaccines are a good example of this. Like the willingness to pay the vaccine. It's a severity of a disease times like your perceived probability of getting that disease in your lifetime, right? So like mm -hmm. the willingness to pay for like a shingles vax or whatever is like quite low. Like vaccines like before COVID basically don't make that much money because because you're like curing your population in many right, ways. Right, 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 right. Um, and you're and that goes directly against market. a lot of the social medicine in general because it's very preventative or not preventative, but very uh, reactive, sorry, yep, rather than very proactive. Very reactive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's the same thing with um, like in a sort of different thing in like single payers. I, I went to Sweden because I was interested in single payer. It's also why I did my PhD at Oxford as I was interested in the NHS. And, you know, they, they each have their own flaws. Um, one thing is like, you know, challenge paying for things. Um, but they're really good at preventative medicine because they're, you know, economically incentivized. It, the incentives are aligned, right? Like the mm. NHS pays for you at birth and it pays for you when you're 50. Um, but it doesn't have that much money to pay for you. So you're not going to get access necessarily to all the same drugs that you might do if you're um, in America and the late life drug that you're definitely really going to want if like you have terminal cancer, you know, even if it's uneconomically advisable, you're still sure. going to want it and you're not going to get it, right? Right, right. right. Um, because it won't like, because it's like, uh, not ICER, but whatever the equivalent in um, the UK is, like won't justify like the quality willingness to pay. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, that's the kind of other problem I want to work on, like post loyal, um, if there is a post post loyal is, um, when you're retired, yeah. you know, you're going to get into yeah. politics and all this other when stuff. When I'm the chairman <laughs> or whatever, chairwoman, um, is yeah. actually healthcare because that's a problem that you like very briefly tried to work on this, but like, that's a problem that you really can only tackle when you have a lot of money. Right, right. And I mean, and I, I, the behemoth that is the United States healthcare system, I and mean, you're going up against, you know, the perennial title holders, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a big edifice that you're going up against. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's uh, wrap this up. I, I usually basically ask my, uh, each, each of my kind of conversation podcast guests, uh, one last question. So I, I, I dub it the overview effect question. Um, the overview effect is basically when uh, astronauts see the earth from space and they also like have a psychological breakthrough, you know, in themselves by seeing the world, you know, basically yeah. uh, together, they see uh, plants, animals, humans, everything is earthlings, you know, not as this like dichotomies and, and all this other stuff is ecological. So what I, what I basically would like to ask is if you were, you know, up there at the ISS or on the moon or on looking down and people are looking up at you, maybe no one's looking up at you, but what, what do you have to say? Uh, we talked a lot about womanhood, we talked a lot about, you know, aging and stuff. Um, are there any parting words or things that you would, you would kind of like to say, because you have the platform. So I think I would say work on important problems is the big one. Um, you know, like this that. is not necessarily easy, but I think it's seen as astronomically hard when actually a lot of work can be done just because there's somebody running on it, mm. so mm. to speak, right? And there are, you know, like, oh, the technical risk, oh, like the market risk or whatever, but like, there's a lot of things that kill companies that are technically easy. Uh, and there's also a lot of benefit of working on something interesting and important. Like, you know, a lot of people want to work with us on it now. We get a lot of opportunities because we're one of the few people in the field. Sure. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing is just like, I don't know, I have like a somewhat aggro view that <laughs> if you're like able and well, like you have responsibility to do things that help other people. And it can be in like a one-to-one, -one, like a mm -hmm. doctor or even a good parent, you know, like hits this in many ways. Um, but if you can scale it, I mean, there's obvious benefits to that. Beautiful. Beautiful. So do what you can when you can, but then scale it also. <laughs> I love if you it. want, I mean, it's like, if you're, oh. you know, it just depends on your skill set, but. Totally. Totally. And uh, I don't, I, yeah, we don't want to, you know, pigeonhole too many people, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree with the sentiment. 
Um, well, thank you so much, Selena. I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, so we'll just kind of leave it at that. Um, so until next time, at Astra.